Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's live Q&A with Tom. Um, I appreciate everybody tuning in. My name is Wes Van Epps. I'll be uh, kind of moderating today's q and I'm also here with Jessica Geschke. So we're both here from Wisconsin Voices for Recovery. Um, I know that we typically do this on Wednesdays, but we decided to up it to Fridays as well. We've had a lot of uh, people tune in and uh, even message us saying how, uh, you know, just the interactions every week, how people appreciate that. So bringing on people across the country and in the state here and just talking about recovery and um, recovery advocates. So uh, like I said, I welcome you guys. We're going to be bringing on Tom here in just a minute. He is already in the room with us, but just to give him a quick intro. Um, so Tom is a native from Madison. Uh, from 1999 to 2012, he ran the Chris Farley Foundation. Um, so, of course, Tom is Chris's brother. Um, so that is uh, nationally recognized as a nonprofit dedicated to substance abuse prevention. So Tom will be talking a little bit about that today, um, a little bit about Chris's story and how that impacted Tom and the work that he's been doing in the field. So, um so with that, I'm going to bring on Tom. Tom, welcome. Um, if you could just do a quick introduction for us, Tom, and then we'll just, we'll dive right into our main point. Um, of course, you're from Madison. Uh, so if you just want to talk a little bit about your early life in Madison and some of the experiences, your brother, Chris, uh, and how those experiences influenced your advocacy in recovery. Sure. Great. Uh, great. Thanks for having me here. Um, this is uh, fun uh, to uh, do these things. And um, so, yeah, growing up with Chris was always um, interesting. Um, I, you know, I, of course, I drew the short straw. I had to share a bedroom with him. And uh, that uh, <laughs> certainly sent me into many, uh, a lot of therapy sessions just based on that. But, um, you know, I was, uh, we had an older sister, uh, but we have an older sister. But, and then there were four boys. And I was the oldest of the four boys, Chris was the next in line, and then Kevin and Johnny. And so we were always kind of this, this pack, and we were always going to, you know, doing everything together. And But I was always, as the oldest son, I always had this this um, expectation, and, and you know, I, I had this, this kind of kind of role model that I thought that I had to play. <clears throat> and Christopher was always right there behind me, just doing everything opposite that I was doing. So, I mean, I, I just tried everything I could to set an example and it just didn't work. And one, one story I, I talk about all the time, this is, you know, just growing up with Chris, just trying to, you know, you know, help him, uh, <laughs> you know, set an example. But uh, one story I, I love to talk about that I, that uh, a good friend of mine uh, related to uh, in, in the book I wrote about Chris and, uh, and uh, it goes back to our, our time, you know, my parents, um, you know, faced with four boys, uh, for a full summer with no school, um, their their best option they had was to send us all to summer camp for seven weeks and just get us out of there, out of their hair. So, um, and Chris was always performing. Uh, he was always, he loved the crowd. Um, but every, so this summer camp of Northern Wisconsin, we would, um, they would take the Catholic boys every Sunday to into town to, to uh, church. And Chris and I would be on the bus with a bunch of guys and, uh, um, it was great because it was it was the only time we got to see the girls camp from across the lake, you know, so we would always <laughs> perform. And um, uh, and this being the Northwoods of Wisconsin, the, the, the church was outdoors, so amongst the pines, it was beautiful. But it was also summertime. It was br brutal hot. So one one uh, Sunday, we're, we're lining up for communion. Chris is in front of me, and it's 90 degrees out. And I don't know where he got him because su summer camp, you know, you, there was no candy. You didn't, you couldn't. He didn't have it, but somehow Chris found some Tic Tacs and uh, he threw a bunch in his mouth, walked up communion. And then we, we're 12 years old, you know, and all of a sudden I see Chris in front of me, just kind of like wobbling back and forth. And he's, and he's, and he's kind of like staggering and he gets right in front of the girls camp and he just collapses and he slaps his hand on the bench, the benches where we were sitting and his head goes back and he spits out all these Tic Tacs. <laughs> on the, like like there were teeth and these all the girls were like oh my god it's horrible it's horrible and all my buddies are laughing and i'm the oldest brother going don't laugh at him this guy's not he's not funny this isn't funny 
And, you know, as much as I tried, everyone's just laughing. And, I'm, um, you know, and that was just one of so many times that I was, you know, just trying to, you know, um, just play this part. And, and you know, uh, it all these years later, you know, all of a sudden we're both in New York working and, you know, Chris is, you know, you know, here I am in New York. I'm this Georgetown grad, you know, I'm smart. I studied, you know, I dress well and I'm struggling. I'm trying to, you know, make it through in the big city. And, and here Chris comes into town and he, you know, he's, not, he's on, he's just doing the same old stuff and he's on national television. And he's just killing it. And for the life of me, I can't, rem you know, he's, here's this guy that's known for playing all these characters and all he ever was doing was just being Chris from Wisconsin. He never was not that. And I was trying to play this char caricature, this this image of myself, and I was failing. And I guess, you know, one of the messages that, that Chris taught me, and I'll talk about this, is, is just, uh, you know, I thought he was just trying to, you know, just piss me off and push my buttons. But, you know, I'm going to give him credit for what he was really trying to do was, just tell me, you know, Tommy, just be yourself, just, you know, just chill out and, and, and be yourself. And I, and I kind of realized you know, after many, many years that that's all Chris was doing and he was very comfortable doing that. Um, what was interesting though, watching him in New York, you know, we grew up in this heavy drinking culture in Wisconsin. And uh, so people ask me once, you know, a lot of times, you know, uh, well, when did you first notice that, you know, Chris had a problem. It's like, well, we didn't. We grew up in Wisconsin. You know, maybe if we grew up in like, you know, in Utah with the Mormon, you know, maybe, you know, we would, it would stick out more, but our problems don't stick out much here in, uh, in Wisconsin because everyone's kind of doing the same thing. So we didn't notice it. And um, I, you know, it just, it, all of a sudden when Chris achieved something, he really loved and we knew that you know being on Saturday Night Live was just so important to him and but we also saw his his, his drinking and you know it, it is is uh, you know it was good getting out of hand and I remember the first time we had um, an intervention was with some high school buddies that were in town and of course we're like we got to talk to Chris so let's you know let's get him together so you know next thing you know we're we're, we're at PJ Clark's around a table in a bar trying to talk to him about his drinking. And I'm like, we didn't know, we just didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know how to handle this. And this was all new to us, but um, we, at least we sent a message that we were concerned and, and then eventually Chris kind of got it and he got into, uh, got into rehab and he, and he, you know, a couple times it didn't work. And then he finally found a, a place that that worked for it for him and he stopped you know just kind of telling people what he thought they wanted to hear and he just started to do the program and he came back from this stint in in, in minnesota in, in the summer in the summertime and he came back for his third year on saturday night live and he met immediately here's on national television making all this money but he he went to their to the fellowship uh, Hazleton's Fellowship in New York. So he was, you know, going uh, to 30 Rock during the day. And then at nine o'clock at night, he'd, he'd check in, you know, with the, with the, um, the outpatient thing or the in, inpatient and he'd, he'd crawl into his cot and, uh, and, you know, maybe had a meeting and, and go to bed. And, and that was his third year on SNL. He was not in some luxurious apartment or living a high life in New York. He was, he was working the program hard. And uh, from my vantage point, my view, I was like, wow, I mean, you don't have to do this, you know, uh, certainly not, you know, I think he was the only one probably paying full tab, but I mean, he was doing it. And I was kind of, it was the first time I was really kind of impressed with what this like knucklehead younger brother of mine was kind of doing. Um, he was always funny. So the SNL thing was just kind of a like, well, yeah, I guess he, that makes sense. But him taking uh, ownership of his addiction and, and getting into treatment and then working his recovery program was, was really amazing to me. I, I, I uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, it was, it was wild. So, um, and that went on for a while. And uh, I remember 
Chris called me up once and he said, Hey, Tommy, do you want to, can you come to my third year um, anniversary, you know, at a, come to a meeting? And I'm like, um, all right. So I, I, I said, give me the address. And, and he gave me the address and I'm, and I'm walking, I'm looking at the, you know, this card that he's giving me and I'm, I'm kind of walking out. All, all of a sudden I'm like, I'm like on the far West side, you know, midtown. And all of a sudden I realized I'm like deep into hell's kitchen. And I'm like, where has he taken me? I thought it was a joke. And I finally get to this address and it looks like an old bombed out building. And I go upstairs and it looked like they assembled every, you know, um, uh, homeless person in the area to like sit there. And there's Chris at the front of the room in his, in his blazer and tie. And, <clears throat> and he's telling these people, he goes, look, I've been doing this every, every day for three years, meeting here with you people. And I, I you know, I just wanted to tell you, tell you that, you know, I'm, I'm just like you, you know, um, we all woke up this morning um, hoping that we were going to stay sober today. And here we are at the end of the day, we did it. And uh, we got the big payoff. We get, you know, cake and, and coffee at the end. And I'm in the back of the room going, who is this guy? I, I, I It blew me away that, that Christopher was like, first of all, you know, everyone knew who he was. But he's telling these people, I'm just like you. I'm, 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 I'm no different. My disease is the same as yours. And, I, and again, I was like blown away that this, this younger brother of mine was, was doing this. And um, so, um, I, you know, I just saw, started seeing those differences. I mean, even, even to the point of like, he's, he, he was even like, you know, you know, dressing better. You know, he just like really had a control of his life, you know, dressing better. That, that's my my, um, that's where I judge people. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, he, at the same time, he's also being like really, he, he, where, where he was this natural, funny talent, like at Second City in Chicago. And, and uh, uh, when he first got to SNL, all of a sudden he was like really, you know, a master at his craft. He really, he was, I uh, was impressed at how he was um, um, kind of really all of a sudden knew about acting in a way that it went beyond just natural talent. So, you know, he was really, uh, um, you know, really in charge of himself. It was pretty, pretty neat. Um, you know, then, um, you know, you know, he went to Hollywood and, um, you know, there, there was different, you know, it, his life was different. You know, he would, he would be able to go um, every day, you know, practicing and being on TV at second or you know at second city or SNL, so he had that like kind of daily affirmation. I mean, like every single day he had something to get up for, and or he had like you know people applauding him and telling him you know we love you, you're great, this is awesome. Um, but he went to Hollywood. He would do that during a movie. He was really good um, uh, working his program. That is um, while he was working. But then he'd have six months off. And he just couldn't, you know, and then he was getting really big and he couldn't go out in public and it was really hard. And I think that's when he really, um, he, he tried early on out in LA and he had some really good people helping him um, like Tom Arnold and, and things like that. But then he just couldn't sustain it, couldn't, couldn't maintain it. And, and, you know, we, we know the rest of the story there. It was, it was hard. Um, but that's kind of where, you know, my kind of journey kind of starts, you know. I started off with the Chris Farley Foundation. Um, wanted to go into schools and, and talk to kids about, um, you know, uh, Chris's, you know, life. And, and, and it was really easy for me because my life didn't change in terms of, you know, you know my, my drinking. I, I, there, I, had, I, had, I had long periods of sobriety, but I never was really working a program. Um, I, so I, I kind of know when I, when I don't, when I'm not in a program, my, my, I got five years, I can do this on my own kind of white knuckling it, but sooner or later, um, I would always come back to drinking. And, uh, so it was, and it was really easy for me to talk about somebody else's recovery, you know, talking about Chris's, but, um, you know, over time, um, you know, I started to focus on my own, my own recovery. So, um, uh, and I always reflected back on Chris's messages of just be yourself and be comfortable. And um, so, 
you know, that started, you know, my journey. At the same time, what I was doing was um, I was going into schools and, and really, I kind of looked at like, what do I, how do I do this? How do I talk to people about, you know, um, Chris's addictions and his recovery and, and how do I send a message to them? And I went back to all my brothers who went to um, through Second City in Chicago and learned the craft of, of improv. And I, I looked at improv and like, wow, this is, you know, it's all about, the more I studied it, I realized it was more about um, uh, communication and how to communicate and um, how to work on an ensemble, how to work with people, how to, how to, um, uh, you know, accept. There was a lot of, lot, of, lot of talk about acceptance and non-denial. And so I would go in, I started off here in Madison going into um, recovery groups with teens. And it was interesting. Um, they'd be working on the recovery, but I'd, I'd be looking at these teens, boys and girls from different high schools, kind of, you know, different ages, you know, some freshmen, some sophomores, some junior seniors. So like, and they put them in and they said, start talking about, you know, your, uh, your struggles. And I immediately saw this as a, as prob- as a problem because, you know, kids don't normally do that. Teens don't certainly don't normally do that. So how do you get these kids to share? And I said to a friend of mine that was running these groups, I said, you know, why don't you let me come in and just do some improv games? Let's just kind of break down these barriers and, and get them to talk about, you know, learning that yes and, learning that acceptance, learning that, you know, it's okay to, um, to share um, in a trusting environment once you built that trust. And that's what we did. And we just did some games. And all of a sudden, these, the, the, this, this group of, of, of just different, you know, teens started to um, feel comfortable with each other and started to share because they felt that there was trust and whatever they said was going to be accepted. And then I would, I would do these games. I'd, I'd teach them this, this concept. And then I'd say, okay, see ya. Now you can work your recovery. Now you can, you can um, uh, really uh, um, make some progress with, with your, just by teaching them how to, how to communicate better. And uh, we saw some great results. It was, it was pretty amazing. And um, um, because one of the things I, I looked at in improv and in recovery uh, are there, those two things are based on one really key uh, element and that's honesty. Mm-hmm. And uh, I would say, look, you know, build some honesty in, in the way you communicate with your, with your peers. And, um, and uh, that will also help you um, as you communicate better, it'll help you in your, in your recovery program. And, and so, um, yeah, we just, you know, it was, we saw some amazing um, results with that. And so I, you know, I, I still, kind of use that improv uh, lessons learned from my brothers um, to, to uh, not just in my own recovery, but in, in teaching other people. And so I saw some pretty amazing um, stuff uh, going out in the foundation doing that. And, I, and again, um, here I was preaching honesty um, and it took me a long time to, to adapt that to my own um, program, my own recovery. And um, I had to constantly remind myself, you know, just start to be um, open and honest. And, you know, I was, it was really easy to be honest talking about Chris's recovery. Um, but when I had to shift gears and start talking about my own recovery, I had to, I had to build that up again. I had to, um, I had to build my, you know, that, that, that ability to be honest with myself. And so, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was an interesting transition. And yeah. Uh, <laughs> It, 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 yeah, it, it really worked. Um, so, you know, I guess, um, you know, it kind of brings me to this kind of interesting time we have here. You know, we're, um, uh, I look at it as, um, uh, you know, it's a, you know, I, I talk about redefining community. I, th- I think, you know, this is, I don't think the lights are going to come on here, you know, in a month or two or, you know, the end of the summer and we're going to go back to, to um, what we were doing before. You know, I think we've got a new normal, you know, kind of building up and um, 
I also think that there's, you know, and, and so, you know, community was usually like a group of like-minded people and they, then they, they, they come together and, and here's our community. This is what we believe. And you had to find, you know, your community, but I think we're going to see some reaching out, some, some broadening of, of, of what those um, definitions of, of community are, um, you know, um, particularly in recovery, you know, it's, I think we're going to be looking at more, um, you know, mental health is going to be brought a lot more into the, uh, into the equation. Cause I don't know about you guys, but I'm going friggin' nuts here. Um, <laughs> sitting at yeah. home on myself. I'm going to, I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to need a little, uh, a little bit more community uh, coming out of this. <laughs> so, uh, but I also think it's going to be, you know, right now, right here now, um, this is the, like these Zoom meetings and things like that. And I'm going to, you know, now we're going to, you know, AA meetings, you know, in this kind of format. And I think it's, it's a, it's, it's, um, it's going to open up doors to people. I think that were hesitant before to go to an AA meeting. Let's say, I think there's opportunities to like reach out to people. Like, look, now you, you know, like when you walk into a group, you know, uh, it, you know, you're sitting there in your chairs or couches in, in a group and you're the fir- you're brand new. You're, you know, and they even say, you're like, it, 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 you know, anyone's first meeting and you got to raise your hand. And so it's, um, it can be intimidating. Um, yeah. And I think now there's an opportunity here for people to, to reach out to people or people to come into this, <clears throat> this uh, recovery community um, kind of, you know, a- at their own pace. You know, you can you could join a a, a a Zoom meeting. You know, you you don't have to say anything. You can you know you can just be there and listen, and 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 grow uh, some uh, <clears throat> um, uh, you know, grow in stages. And 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 you know, by the time this is all done, we're back into the to, to the rooms and things like that. And I don't know if we'll still be able to, you know hold hands and hug people, but, uh, right. <laughs> um, um, so I was always a little uncomfortable with that to begin with. But, um, no, but I know you know, that, I, you know, I, I think, I think there's, there's an opportunity now to, to, to for people to, to, to kind of take this in, 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 in little steps. And I think, um, um, that will be, uh, I, I hope that that's what our de- redefining community means is, is, is doors will be open to people. And I think, um, you know, it, there's, it's less intimidating now in this time frame to, to join uh, and to, to work on your recovery. <clears throat> um, I would also say I was, I would hope that we see, you know, when I, when I lived in New York with Chris and after Chris, um, you know, I lived through 9-11. I was out there with 9-11. And 9-11 to New Yorkers is, is different uh, to, than to most people. Most people kind of knew it as an event. We saw it as, you know, we, we knew people that, that, that we, lost, you know, we lost people. You know, we, it was, you know, New Yorkers have, have this kind of, you know, we, we, you know, you head down, you know, we, we have a sense of purpose and we, you know, we can kind of ignore people and just because we got our things. But after 9-11, there was just this, this increased empathy you know, it was a, it was a real community. And I, you know, and that was, you know, it was confined to a, a small geographic area, but it was amazing. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping we see a little bit of that after this. I think we will because we're, because now we're, we've all, we're all going through this. And I think that's another, you know, um, uh, positive for the recovery, you know, for the recovery movement is, um, is that increased empathy and people on, and understanding what people are going through. Um, and uh, so I, I'm, I'm looking uh, forward to, to seeing that play out as well. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, and I think too, I mean, you know, there's, there's so many different things that are having to adjust right now. So many people having to change uh, their daily life. And I know that for you, Tom, I know that you're, um, you're a big motivational speaker, um, and I'm sure that you've had events that you've had to cancel or postpone. Oh, absolutely, uh, yeah. Have you have you always been the type of person that 
would jump up and and be willing to speak in front of crowds or, or was, was that always built into your person or is that something that you uh, you had to work on um yes uh, uh no absolutely not um uh what I used to, and, and and it's funny. I, I call that um, what I talk about now with, with that is is um, look getting up in front of people. It's not a normal thing, you know. People don't do that, you know. Even like the greatest speaker, you know, get up. Uh, it's it's not normal to just ex- expose yourself to um, um, you know two, three, four hundred people, and you know, everyone's looking at you. Um, uh, and and I use the word expose yourself in terms of being on stage and talking to people, not in the terms of like like my brother <laughs> Christopher would expose himself. But um, yeah, it's not normal, and so uh, it wasn't comfortable for me. Um, but all um, but um, I learned to be comfortable being uncomfortable, and uh, it's a phrase I use a lot. It's 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 not that I'm not um, uncomfortable. Not it's not that I'm comfortable speaking in front of people anymore. I'm just comfortable doing it. It's, it's a natural thing for me. And I think just like this zoom thing was probably uncomfortable the first time people did it. And now it's, it's becoming more and more natural. I think, you know, it's, and so you've got to, you know, come get outside your comfort zone and, and just realize that this is the new normal and, and be comfortable with it. It's, it's, it's not that it's not uncomfortable. It's just, you just need to be more comfortable with being uncomfortable. And so, um, yeah, I, you know, I, um, I think that's a, I, I tell myself that all the time. Um, you, you were, um, I know that you were, you were actually scheduled to, to join us at the end of this month. Um, and I know that we've rescheduled our stand up for recovery day. Um, oh, right. I forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> they're, I, they're all so, gone. Yeah. It's, yeah. So that's something was, you know, here at Wisconsin Voices, we had to, postpone until actually next year now but um and we're hoping that possibly you could join us for that i know we still have to talk with you a little bit about that but um but yeah so i I mean as far as even looking at some of the other things that you have um scheduled here in the future do you have anything that people that are tuning into today um could look forward to to joining anything that you have that's going to be more of a virtual speaking arrangement or yeah anything? well you know i'm 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 actually um working on a pro project with with hazelton uh right now to try and do more of these things with some some experts and and really uh, g- get out there online and, and just really like 30 minute like you're doing just like you're doing it's, it's great stuff um and just i think really kind of what we're doing now is it, it's the same thing you're doing is is teeing up and keeping people, you know, um, it, you know, we've got to get through this and, and, and just really connecting again, it's it redefining community. It's like, this is now a, a community we've just had here this, this afternoon and just keeping that going and teeing it up so that we can all come, come back into it uh, with um, some new ideas, some new stuff we've learned about ourselves, but um, it's just uh, um getting ready for that. And I, you, the last thing you want to do is just, you know, sit on the couch waiting for, you know, these, you know, public bans to be lifted and I can't do anything because I, you know, it's my life's changed. No, we, there's stuff you can do and you gotta, you gotta keep at it. And, and so, uh, yeah, so keep, I'll, I'll let people know about, about what, what we're going to do there, there in terms of uh, doing these awesome. little 30 minute things. Uh, what I would want to do quick, I do have a couple more questions. I know we're going to go over time a little bit. I don't know if you're you're in a rush, but um, I just want to open up quick to anybody that has questions about what was shared today by Tom. Um, and then I'm just going to close it up with a couple of my own that you could uh, possibly answer for us today. So I just want to open it up quick. If, if anybody has any questions, um, now is the time. Hey, Tom, Jim Moorhead here. How are you doing? Jimmy, how are you, man? Good to see you. Good to see you, too, and thanks for sharing today. Thanks. Thanks for being here. How you doing? Oh, so, um, I don't know, just reaching out. I guess I, I don't know what I want to ask you other than um, what are you doing now for a daily basis? Other than, you know, you go on to Zooms, I guess, you know, Zoom meetings, hey, hey, that's what I've been doing. But uh, 
Well, I'm almost through the um, you know third season of Ozark, and uh, <laughs> here you go. Uh, that's been keeping me uh, very occupied. Um, it's a good show. It's really good, exactly. <laughs> um, I think I binged yeah, it in like seven hours. <laughs> totally. Um, yeah, I'm just. I literally, the, honestly, um, uh, it's touch and go. On, I'll be. I'll be perfectly honest. It's this is not uh, comfortable for me. It's not natural to be. You know. Um, just sitting here, you know, not being um, physically out in, with people. Um, so I've got a really, um, th like the first couple of weeks, uh, week or, you know, in week 10 days when I was doing this, I'm like, this is great. It's like sitting on the couch watching movies. I've trained for this my whole life. This is so easy. <laughs> And, but then I was like, no, this is not, this is not good. You're, you're, you're going to go crazy. And um, I could feel it. You know, and so I actually little things like I, you know, I just started walking. I just started going out and walking, which is literally the most exercise I've had in years. <laughs> and um, uh, just being outdoors in the fresh air, clearing my mind, um, has done a huge, um, uh, uh, huge results for me. So, um, you know, if that's the only thing I'm doing, it's it's big. You know, it's just. That's you know, true. just keeping at, you know, doing the scary, something. The scary thing is that this is perfect if you want to be uh, in active addiction. It's a perfect environment for that because everyone's isolated and you, you can hide. Yeah. So, oh. uh, so it's like, you know, trying to do the opposite thing, right? Trying to do the opposite, best you can here. So. Yeah. And, and you know, and tr just trying to, you know, I'm so focused on like kind of me and, and my program and, and I'm really, tr I'm really, really trying to train myself to, um, to, you know, I, I can isolate with the best of them. And I'm really like forcing myself and holding myself accountable to really reach out to people and call people. Um, uh, I called my, uh, it, you, you'll see him here. I called my friend, uh, our, our friend, Tim Henry, right. uh, right. just yesterday and he hasn't returned my call, but so <laughs> I'm, I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying with him. So. Thanks, well, Jim. It's great to see you, Tom. Yeah, Thanks. good to see you, buddy. Anybody else have any questions for Tom? Okay, Tom, I just have one more question for you then, and then we'll, we'll it's close up here. The hardest one, too. Look, <laughs> what? There's no math, right? Uh, no, no, oh. that's... No, I'll, I'll shoot you some, some problems over after this to do for me. My son's actually doing math homework right now in the other room. So, um, no, so you, you know, in 97, that's when you lost your brother. And, yes. and I guess some, some maybe final words of encouragement or however you want to phrase it to, to individuals that may have lost family members or, you know, siblings, uh, anything that you want to just say, uh, just to give some, some hope of, you know, if people are going through that time right now. Well, you know, find some way, I, I, I tell us to a lot of people, find some way to keep their memory going. You know, I, I talk a lot about, you know, uh, a year after Chris died, my dad died. And, you know, I miss him more than, than Chris, you know, I mean, but, but my experience with my dad dying was more like most people after, after six months kind of nobody asked me about my dad anymore. You know, nobody says, you know, how, you know, I'll remember that story about, you know, your dad, you know, few people do, but not, it's not a lot. With Chris though, it's like every day in my life, mm -hmm. you know, somebody says something or something online is, is mentioned about Chris. And so the conversations is daily. And so, um, and people don't get that. I mean, I get to share that grief with so many people and that's that's a blessing, and it's unique, and I and I don't take it for granted, and so I, I tell people if you can find some little way to to kind of keep that and and conversation going, and and you know when some, when when I know that some, somebody's a family member dies, I I really I, I reach out to them. I say, look, I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to ask, you know, every once in a while, you know, um, about your dad or about your your, your brother or something like that. I'm going to, I'm going to ask, I want to, you know, cause I, I know it's important and uh, I want to let, let's share some stories. Let's like, you know, t tell me, tell me about it. Tell me about that. This person I want to, you know, I want to know. I wish, you know, if more people did that, I think it would make a huge difference with people. Just remember that 
everyone's got a loss and uh, don't, and you know, don't let them kind of live with that themselves. Yeah. Great, great uh, words, words there, Tom. I appreciate that. I know, you know, speaking about your brother um, over the last how many years, I'm, I'm sure it brings up lots of memories and I appreciate you sharing everything that you did today um, about okay. him and even, yeah. even about yourself too. Um, Jess, did you have anything quick that you wanted to share or ask before we close up? Um, sure. Well, first of all, I have two things. Um, so I wanted to quick just give a shout out to the, without calling them out, I guess, but the residential facility that's on the line um, because they were instrumental in um, changing my brother's life. Um, so thank you so much for joining today. And I thought as I was sitting here and listening to you, Tom, about how full circle this has all come. Um, because in 1997, I was graduating high school and that's when my brother's addiction um, just skyrocketed. And I remember watching on the news about uh, your brother's passing and thinking to myself, if this can happen to him, like it could happen, right, to any of us. And the first time I heard you speak was at our recovery rally for Wisconsin Voices for Recovery. It was before I even started working for Wisconsin Voices. <laughs> and I just wanted to thank you because I think during that rally, I was there and I was standing in the crowd and I, I just remember I was so full of just being lost, you know, and I was there and listening to you and you used so much humor um, when you speak about such dark topics that I realized it was okay to laugh and it was okay to be okay with where I was at. And so um, you a big yeah. part in that. And I just want you to know that. And so I, I adore you and I thank you because in my own recovery journey, you have been instrumental. And I know that you, you probably have never heard me say that, but I just really, really thank you for everything you've done for all, all of us in in Wisconsin and beyond. And I, I just really adore you. So I um, really appreciate that. Cause I, I, I know the power of humor. It's a great mm -hmm. coping mechanism. And even in this, you know, uh, very, uh, serious and sober discussion, you know, you, you got, you gotta have some humor. You gotta laugh. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you, Jen. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, again, thank you, Tom. Um, I appreciate it. And if anybody tuned in late, um, this will be posted on our Facebook. Tom, I appreciate you joining us. Hopefully we'll be seeing you again in a few months. We'll get together. Thoughts. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so with that, I'm going to tune off everybody. I hope everybody has a great weekend and stay safe and try to get outside. It's supposed to be a little nicer this weekend. Um, so yeah, thank you everybody for tuning in again today. And be on the lookout next week. We do have two more awesome speakers coming up too. So we will get that material posted on our website and on our Facebook. So with that, we'll sign off. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Wes. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. See ya. Bye.